So, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you again for coming on here. Um, I just want to, getting right into it, just ask you, what do you see as your role here, David Icke, in this incarnation? What do you, I've heard comments online saying you are a disinformation agent, you are a controlled opposition, you're just trying to sell your books. I don't believe that. Um, well, you- frankly, I, I don't care if you did. Um, and I don't <laughs> care who does. Because um, I don't live my life by what other people choose to think of me. Uh, I was um, a television presenter uh, with the BBC, and I was doing okay uh, when my life changed and uh, my life crashed all around me. And I went through levels of ridicule uh, in the early, mid, late 1990s that were of historic proportions um, in this country, but wider as well as I became known uh, further afield. And um, I couldn't walk down any street in Britain without being laughed at. I was told I was a nutter. I, uh, uh, you know, comedians only had to say my name and they'd get a laugh. There was no joke required. I was the joke. Uh, But I kept going. And then I uh, came across um, some very uh, far out things. And I started talking and writing about them. And I was an even bigger nutter. And I was saying things like, if humanity doesn't wake up, there is going to be a global fascist dictatorship beyond anything that Orwell could have imagined. And I said that, and that was far out. And that was, uh, you're mad. And... Where were all these people then? These people that say, that David Icke is a disinformation agent. Where were they then? If they knew me, they were laughing. Mm. And then it all comes to pass. And when it comes to pass, having been proved correct, uh, despite all the ridicule, you're a disinformation agent. (laughs) So you'll forgive me, I'm sure if I don't take those people seriously on the basis that they don't take themselves seriously. (laughs) And, and, you know, if if what people thought of me was important to me, I wouldn't have done almost anything that I've done in the last 30 years. Because if you go through this, um, this mental gymnastics process of, if I say this, what will people think of me? Then uh, you cease to be you and you take on a persona that is what others um, expect you to be. So you cease to be you and you become them. And one thing, you know, well, I've learned many things, but one thing I've learned over all these decades is that what people think today, they'll think something else tomorrow. So many people who ridiculed me, and I will admit it now, are now reading my books. Hmm. And and so if I hadn't said what I said and wrote what I wrote because of what will people think of me, then people wouldn't be looking at my work in vast numbers now because of what was in the books has turned out to be true because it would never have been in the books. I wouldn't have written it. And, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest prison that people live in is the fear of what other people think. It's the prison that stops you being you and turns you into what others expect you to be. And, um, you know, I can understand people who have not had access to any of this information. Uh, uh, why they just um, believe whatever they're told by the BBC or CNN or the government or whatever. I can understand that. But those people who, who've seen some of this information, enough to say Ike's a disinformation agent, and they can see where the world's going, or, or I mean, if they've got a brain cell on active duty, they will now. 
And yet, that's their only contribution. Yeah. What are you doing? Grow up. <laughs> wake up. Seriously. I'm sure such people are telling other people, you've got to wake up. Well, do it yourself first. Mm -hmm. How many people uh, have actually been on the front line of this since 1990? Virtually nobody. One or two. Uh, and um, the uh, the idea that you'd go through what I've gone through um, as a disinformation agent is just ridiculous. And it's like everything, you know. When people open their mouth, they think they're making statements about other people, but they're not. Every time we open our mouth, every time we say something, we are making a statement not about other people, but about ourselves. And uh, if we uh, start to realize that, then um, we might start um, looking inward and not looking outward at everything and um, and uh, completely misreading what's happening. Mm. That was a great answer. I was hoping you'd say something like that. <laughs> Did you, how, So the ridicule and what you went through is what actually allowed you to escape the prison of the ego, right? And escape the prison of what other people think, right? Well, yes. Um, and, you know, when I look at my life, and if people just sat down and looked at their life, they would see the same sequence. It appears to be a series of random events. Well, it seems, it seems to be to most people. But when you stop and you look back, you realize that it, it, it's not random events. It's actually a series of events. At any point uh, in, in, our, in our life, in our experience, we can maybe see the next turn on the river as we're paddling down the river. Uh, but um, there's other levels of us that can see the whole river from source to sea. And things that look a certain way from a five sense point of view look totally different from the bigger picture point of view. What can be a, a challenge or something you really don't want to happen can actually, from this level, be a gift because this level knows what's down the road and it knows what you, what you need to meet the challenges down the road and to do what you need to do down the road. So, for example, it, it, you can be paddling down the river and you've got this in your mind, I want to get to this point on the river by nightfall. Uh, and then you can spring a leak and you paddle to the shore and you're cussing and um, and, 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 and kicking the ground uh, because you're so unlucky and you're so frustrated, unlucky rather, and so frustrated. And you're sitting there on the bank feeling sorry for yourself. And someone comes along and says, mate, you were so bloody lucky. There's a freaking big waterfall around that bend, which you would have headed for if you hadn't sprung a leak. So suddenly a, a, a problem, a, a disappointment, a frustration becomes a gift. And so in this area that you're talking about, uh, the mass ridicule that I went through was an absolute gift because um, I didn't know at the time that did, but I didn't, five cents, uh, David I, that um, what was coming was information which was so far out to most people but when you talked about it, you were going to get laughed at and ridiculed. And the last thing that you need to have when that point comes is fear of what other people think, because you ain't going to say it. You ain't going to uh, uh, talk about it. And so um, I was um, someone in my earlier life uh, who, um, you know, didn't like ridicule. I wasn't someone that, um, that, that really would felt comfortable like that. But then I faced this tidal wave of it. And uh, I reached the point uh, where I said, well, they're laughing at me. They're all laughing at me. So what I can do is either, you know, withdraw from the world or I can come out of the fire um, with a backbone of steel. And that's what I chose to do. And it is an extraordinary uh, 
relief, release. When you no longer go through that process of what do I say or what do I don't say so this person or these people will think I'm okay, that won't laugh at me, won't really kill me or, or abuse me or whatever. And as a result of that mass ridicule, it reached the point where I didn't care. So um, from that point, you open your mouth and you say what you think. Not on the basis of how people will receive this, but this is what I think. And, you know, this mass hysterical censorship is not going on now for a bit of fun and a laugh. It's going on to stop the circulation of information that people need to hear. That's why it's happening. And the greatest form of censorship, even more than Facebook and Google and YouTube, is self-censorship. Because of this process we're talking about, where I better not say this or what will they think? And that's even more extreme now when what you are allowed to think and allowed to say is so fiercely um, policed. Uh, the self-censorship that's going on now worldwide is will be fantastic and i choose not to do that and i choose not to do it for a number of reasons one i long left behind caring what other people think it doesn't it's, it's not done in an arrogant way where you say i don't care what you think you listen to to reason argument and information if they say no well, I, i'm looking at it this way and so yeah, that makes sense That's, yeah, I like that. but you won't let what you you, what you conclude be censored by fear of what um, other people think and there's another aspect to this a kind of a bigger aspect and that's when you stop self-identifying the I with the labels of a human life a very brief human life uh, I am a man, I'm a woman, I'm this religion, that religion, this race, that race, this sexuality, that sexuality. And you realize that they're just brief experiences, brief experiences for consciousness, which is, which is eternal, which is infinite, which is forever exploring, well, forever. Uh, and you start to play the long game in the sense that you don't uh, feel the need to to go into a sprint from A to B, from the, uh, from the womb to the grave, in a gotta, 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 uh, where, you know, um, gotta do this, gotta do that, gotta do the other. And you don't either um, see a human life as a thing in itself, but as a, just one brief experience in an infinite experience. And, and when you're coming from the fact that I am the consciousness having the experience, I'm not the experience itself. That's what I'm having. That's what the labels are. Then <clears throat> lots of things change. For instance, go back to the same thing. What people think about you and, and say about you or whatever pales into insignificance because they are commenting, perceiving on a tiny little fragment of a tiny little experience called a human life. Uh, you don't um, become intimidated by authority, for instance, because you, 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 you're playing the long game. Whatever happens, it's just an experience, and there'll be another one along in a minute. So instead of saying, um, okay, <clears throat> this is what I believe I need to do. This is what I believe is right to do. But hold on a minute. What are the consequences for me of doing it? Because once you ask that question, um, 
your your five sense mind will start listing all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. But if you if you um, if you're coming from the big picture, and you realize that this is just a brief experience called human, then what you do is you, you do what you know to be right, and what you feel to be right, and you don't go through the um, through the process of yeah, but what are the consequences for me? Because to ask that question, what are the consequences for me, is to contemplate not doing what you know to be right. So I'm not saying you walk in front of a, a bus or a truck and, oh, I don't care about the consequences. No, I mean, you know what the consequences are if you do that. I'm talking about the consequences for doing what you know to be right, for speaking what you know um, to be right. Uh, because once you, once you start going into the realm of, yeah, but what will happen if I do? Then you're going to convince yourself most of the time that you shouldn't do what you know to be right. And, and you know, there's so many people around the world now with this COVID crap going on that um, know that they should speak out. People in the medical profession, people in other areas, they know they should speak out. Uh, and um, they know they should not acquiesce with their own enslavement. But they do it because they've gone through the list. What are the consequences for me of doing it? And uh, and so um, it's a it, it's a massive massive prison for people to live in, and it, it is a prison because um, vast numbers of the um, members of the human race are currently in a situation of tyranny when there's billions of them and a handful ultimately of those that are driving the tyranny. And it's because instead of this is what I know I should do, it's, ah, but what are the consequences of doing it? Mm. So there is a deliberate effort from the powers that be that are, that are keeping the truth, which is that we are infinite consciousness, having this subjective experience in our bodies uh, forever, essentially. Uh, they're keeping that truth from us is like there is this that like i would would you say all the conspiracies quote unquote lead to that one like the ultimate truth of infinite consciousness that's the foundation of it um you imagine trying to manipulate and impose your will when especially when there's comp uh, comparatively well more than comparatively when you're a tiny number and that which you are targeting is uh, uh, a massive number. Um, then imagine if that massive number was all aware that it is a point of attention in an infinite flow of consciousness and that the perception that that point of attention has dictates what experience follows what we call cause and effect, I suppose. Imagine that. Uh, you imagine if you had billions of people who were doing what they knew to be right and not being imprisoned by fear of the consequences, then that would be an impossible group of people to manipulate. Impossible. What if that group of people knew that Although we um, are points of attention, unique points of attention, we should celebrate that uniqueness. But ultimately, we're all expressions of the same consciousness. And so the, the divisions of race and, and religion and uh, sexuality, all of it, it's just illusory. We're divided by our experience, which we perceive to be our, um, the I. If you realize we're all the same eye, but just different unique expressions of that eye, then, of course, the potential of the few to divide and rule the many, which is essential to any situation where the few control the many, would be gone. So the, the, the situation basically is this. You have um, two worlds in this reality. One world is the world of the general population, and that world has to be kept in a state of limited knowledge, not least about the nature of reality and the nature of the eye. And then you've got this other world, 
which I call the global cult because it's a network of interconnecting secret societies with ultimately a central leadership, uh, which passes through the generations, through the secret society network. That's why they're secret. These, um, these hidden truths of the nature of reality, the nature of the eye, and also how our perceptions become our reality, how our perceptions become our experience. So if your perception is that you're little me, you will live a little me life until that perception changes. Because it's, 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 it's what happens. You, if you, if you uh, perceive yourself to be little me, I have no power, you're going to live a very different life, have a series of very different experiences to someone who's aware uh, that they're um, an expression of all that is, has been, and ever can be. Uh, and so, like I say, if, if, if you, you're dealing with, with um, billions of people that have that uh, awareness and sense of self, you ain't going to manipulate them as you will manipulate people who think they're little me, I have no power. And, and so squeezing the, um, the perceptions, the knowledge of the target population is absolutely vital. It can't be done otherwise. And so they control the education system, which is a programming system. They control the media. See, if perceptions become reality, then where do perceptions come from? They come from information received, which we process into a perception. And that perception becomes behavior, and that behavior we call our life, and the collective behavior becomes human society. Uh, so this other world knows that if they can control perception through control of information, they will control behavior and thus control human society, which is collective behavior. And, and that's the dynamic that's going on. So fundamental uh, to this conspiracy is for this um, reality, secret reality, to keep uh, the target population in a state of ignorance. Mm. So you, if you can get them to believe in a religion um, religiously, focus their attention, and anything outside that religious belief system must be wrong, then you put someone in a prison of the mind. Because um, it's, uh, it's a phrase that um, is attributed to um, Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, words to the effect of wisdom is knowing how little we know. When you realize that we are, yes, a point of attention, and uh, that attention is focused in a tiny band of frequencies um, through the decoding processes of the body and the brain, then you are well aware that there's always an enormity more to know than we know. So all the time when you realize that, you're light on your feet going where the information takes you. You've not got limitations of belief that say, I can't go there because it's outside my religious belief system. What will the Pope think? What will the Imam think? Whatever. You go where the information takes you because you know that wisdom is knowing how little we know. And, 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 and given we know so little in the situation we're in, then obviously there's more to know than we think we know. And when anyone kind of concludes that they know what they need to know and all there is to know and all that stuff, then, then they're in a prison. Because the one thing you know, there's always more to know than you think you know. So if you, if you take a religious belief system and you, um, you focus upon it at the exclusion of all other possibility, because you go into that other possibility and you're breaking the belief system of the religion, so you can't do that, then you're in a prison of the mind. Uh, you're in a prison of the mind in the same way if you uh, go down the road of this world is all there is and uh, life's a bitch and then you die uh, and, and that's all there is. That's a prison of the mind because it is saying there is one possibility. When we are living 
in an infinite possibility. I mean, when we use the phrase, all that is, has been, and ever can be, what that simply means is all potential. Anything's possible. And if you if you break it down, um, one of the great prisons of the mind, and this cult knows that, is to limit and squeeze humanity's sense of the possible. Because once you do that, then so many things are happening, including things being done by this cult, that you dismiss as not possible because in your reality, that's not possible. But in, in reality, it is possible. And not easy possible, it's being done. So putting people in these, these little boxes of sense of the possible is very, very, um, very, very important to this cult. And if you limit your sense of the possible, your sense of what is possible, you lim limit your sense of your own possibility. So, mm. for instance, if you, if you see the world as solid um, and physical, then you'll look at how things could be changed and you'll think it has to be grindingly slow. You have to do physical things to change it. So you have to have a, a meeting, a committee, someone take the minutes, and so on. And, and your sense of the possible will be incredibly limited by the sense of a physical solid world. But if you realize that actually this solidity is illusory, that, that what we see as solidity is actually holographic, and that the holographic is, is a, 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 if you like, a three-dimensional um, expression of an information field, then suddenly if the information field changes, then the holographic expression of it must change. And that can happen very fast. It doesn't have to happen slowly. And where I'm going with this is, is again, the same dynamic. Perception creates reality. Perception creates experience. So when you, you're looking at it at that level, my perception becomes my experience, collective perception becomes collective experience. Then instead of changing, even on a massive scale, being slow, laborious, and grinding, it can change in an instant. Because what we call human society, the way it plays out, everything, is simply a collective version of collective human perception. Collective human perception changes, then its expression must change. The world will change. Say uh, we all decided to um, see each other as different expressions of the same consciousness. Say we all decided, perceived, to, to love each other and to see that the divisions between us are illusions just to give us an, a certain experience. It's not real. I mean, it's not who we are. Like, suddenly, vast numbers of people start having that perception and that interaction with each other. Well, what's going to change? The oh, world's wow. going to transform. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, this is what happens when you limit information. You get people to believe that something's not possible, like, you know, meaningful change, when actually it is possible, but only if you know how the world is being created second by second by our own uh, perception. So what happens is that our perceptions become our experience, and the cult knows that. So if it knows that if it can uh, manipulate our perception, it will dictate our, uh, our experience, our behavior, and if it can do it on a big enough scale, it will dictate the nature of human society. So if you if you look at this COVID uh, stuff from the start of 2020, um, people in the spring of 2020 um, went under house arrest, meekly, mildly, 
because they perceived, information received, that there was a deadly virus. And they perceived that the people in charge cared about them. Bit of a joke, but they, they again, many believe it. Uh, and so, therefore, when they, people in charge, said, oh, you, you, well, you need to go under house arrest, lockdown, to protect you and your family from this deadly virus, well, that they did. So they went into that situation, which has devastated the lives of so many people, not least people with businesses and employment. They did that because of their perception that there was a deadly virus. Then there's another group that was questioning this. You know, well, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I believe all this. But they went under house arrest because they asked the question, yeah, but what are the consequences for me if I, if I challenge this, if I, if I, if I don't um, acquiesce to it? And so they went under house arrest. And that left a small number, relatively small number, very small number, that could see it and weren't having it either. Um, and uh, those three perceptions, particularly the first two perceptions, were how a handful of people, uh, ultimately at the core, uh, put billions um, under house arrest mm. without really a murmur at, at that time, the first one in the, in the spring. Uh, because they control perception. This is why they control the media. This is why they control the education system. This is why they control Silicon Valley, because these are the sources of information that become human perception. Yeah. Wow. How long has this been going on for, the control from this cult, would you say? Has this been throughout the entire history of humanity, or was there like a certain time period where these this force decided to take control of our perception well i i don't think the entirety of it but it goes back thousands and thousands of years um and i do think there was a a big change in human perception that happened way back and i do think it's linked to the biblical theme of the sons of god who interbred with the daughters of men uh, because when you look around the different cultures that are nothing to do with Christianity and the Bible, you see the same recurring theme of a non-human force operating in the hidden. And, you know, th this world is a frequency band, and it's a tiny frequency band. If people have not come across this before, just look at the band of frequency that that within which they can see a visual reality. It's laughable, it's so tiny, uh, visible light as they call it. Uh, and anything beyond that frequency, we can't see because it's outside of our, of our range of visual perception. Uh, but you see this recurring theme, uh, or obviously they use different names for this force um, as, as they would in different cultures. But um, they, they talk about the same thing, about being manipulated from, from, the, from the hidden. And I do think that there was a point where, where humanity was uh, genetically manipulated. And if you look at the body, uh, it's what I've been calling for decades a, a biological computer. It's, it's an information field which processes information just like this computer in front of me, is information which processes information. There's information which encodes information, and there's information which decodes information, but it's all in the interaction of um, information. And so we, we look at the world um, that we see. Why does an elephant act like an elephant? Why does an elephant act like a duck? Why does a duck act like a duck and not act like a like a cow? Because they're different information fields which process information in different ways. So we call ourselves human when the real I is consciousness beyond form because the information fields of the body decode information in a certain way and that way, uh, that, that, that band of 
the overall way is what we call human. So if you um, change the information field by infusing other information into it, you can change the way it processes information. And so suddenly the nature of human becomes something different. And, you know, they talk about the, you know, the period of the golden age um, when I feel that I go into all this in the books, but when um, human consciousness was, was much more expansive, when it could perceive far more. Uh, because when, when I started realizing a long time ago now that the unbelievably um, limited nature of our visual reality and our reality in general, it's so tiny, it's almost, like I say, laughable, but it's, all, it's also, to an extent, bewildering. Why can we see so little? And I think part of this genetic uh, tinkering squeezed through this information change uh, in the decoding processes of the body, it squeezed um, our visual reality. And it, of course, if you, if you want to target a population, then do you want them seeing that or do you want them seeing that? Well, the question answers itself. So I do think that this, this sons of God are interbred with the daughters of men uh, uh, theme is, is very, very significant in a change that happened in, uh, in humanity when we became less aware of the greater picture. Mm. And um, there's another aspect to this, which I kind of started perceiving after the turn of just after the turn of the millennium that this is some kind of um, simulation and so if you if you bring it all together what is the simulation it's information so people talk about the matrix okay so what is the matrix take um take the the theme of the matrix movies you're out of the matrix and then they put the thing in the back of your neck and you start processing the information of the matrix. And at that point, you perceive and experience as if you are in the matrix. What's happened is you've been given a different information source and that is suddenly your reality. So this matrix, this simulation is simply information. But... It's information that has to be decoded. Otherwise, people will not experience it, just like, you know, radio stations, television stations sharing the same space in the old analog system. If you're not on its frequency to, of that information to decode it, then it just you're not even aware of its existence. Mm. So the two things go together. The creation of an information construct that um, people call the matrix or the simulation and the, uh, if you like, physical form, the biological computer that is tuned to that information source. So it decodes it into a sense of reality. And you can see the, uh, the parallels of this with with computer games, virtual reality games, you know, what do the five senses do? They pick up um, vibrational frequency information. They turn it into electrical signals and send it to the brain. And the brain constructs reality from that information. So um, if you take the ear, the ear um, doesn't hear words. It picks up frequency fields, like from the vocal cords. And it decodes that information from the frequency state into an electrical state, not a form of frequency really, and then uh, it, it, it uh, communicates it to the brain. And only when the brain decodes that information do we hear words, uh, do we hear sound. Um, you know, if you, um, if you get smacked on the leg, then an information uh, um, signal goes from that point of impact to the brain. 
And only when the brain decodes it do we say, ouch. Uh, and there are uh, pain relief um, techniques now, which are designed to stop that signal taking place so that the brain doesn't say, ouch, because it doesn't feel anything. So it, it's all an illusion of um, frequencies turning to, to electrical signals and communicated to the brain, which then constructs reality from that information. And if you look at a, a virtual reality game, they are hacking into that process. So you put the headset on, you put the, the earphones on, you put the gloves on in these more sophisticated ones to simulate touch. And um, that information overrides the normal decoding of reality. And you've only got to see these people who, who are, you know, got the headset on on all this gear, and you see them reacting. To them, it's absolutely real because the brain thinks, well, you know, I'm just decoding information like I was before. This seems, seems real to me. And so people are frightened or, or whatever, or they think they're falling over a cliff. Uh, and all they're doing is decoding information from a, from a technological source. So th what this matrix is, is, is a similar principle. It's something that um, has been created to be the, 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 the dominant source of information that we decode, thus it, it becomes the reality we think we're decoding. And I, I can kind of concluded this uh, and many other things, and then I came across the amazing find in Nagamadi, about 75, 80 miles north of um, Luxor in Egypt. In 1945, in an earthen jar, they found this treasure trove of writings from um, the Gnostics, a belief system, the Gnostic belief system. The Gnostics were the people that basically ran the Great Library or Royal Library of Alexandria, and which was a, a, an incredible um, depository of information from the ancient world. And they were coming to scientific conclusions. Uh, way back then, that have been confirmed, you know, thousands of years or hundreds of years later. And this, these writings, um, the Mag uh, Nagamadi uh, Library, I think they call it, I've got them all up there in great detail, a couple of books, um, which, uh, which have translated them. And they describe not only a non-human force manipulating human society from the hidden. They call them the archons, which is Greek for rulers. But they describe the fact that we live in a fake reality and that true prime reality is beyond the fake reality and that the fake reality has been created by this these archontic um, gods, this archontic force. And as I'm, as I'm reading through their descriptions, it's very clear that if you take the way they obviously describe things from their time period perspective, if you just transfer what they say into the modern world of technology and virtual reality, that we live in a, that, that they were describing uh, rather, a, a simulation. And you know, when I concluded this, uh, the simulation stuff, just after the turn of the millennium, there was only one other person who I really came across called Nick Bostrom at Oxford University. He didn't see it the same way that I saw it, but he, he, he was writing about the possibility we live in a simulation. But now it's, um, it's really gathered pace uh, within science and uh, the simulation hypothesis is supported by a lot of people in the mainstream as an explanation for what the hell is going on and where the hell we are. Hmm. Uh, and, and so if you, the five senses are not only locked in to this matrix, this simulation, they're freaking decoding it, right? Um, so if you only uh, live your life and perceive from the perspective of the five senses, then you're in the matrix and you are of the matrix because it's your only reality that you, you, you consciously perceive. Uh, and, and, and so that's where you're trying to get a fix 
on what's happening and who you are, where you are. You're trying to get a fix from the very informational prison that you're locked into. But when you start to expand your awareness, when when the the nature of the eye is transformed into a perception of a much greater self, with that expansion of the sense of identity expands the consciousness relating to that self-identity. And you start to breach the walls of the matrix. You start to breach the walls of the five sense reality. And from that perspective, it, you start to see things suddenly that you weren't seeing before. That can see the dots. That can see how the dots connect. We're back to the river mm. from source to sea or the next turn in it. And, and so those that awaken, and we're talking to the shamans of history and all the different people that have um, gone into these other levels of reality beyond the beyond the confines of the matrix, you start to see a very different world and you start to see a very different reality. And you start to see this world in very different terms. And um, you look through history about how those people are always the ones that have been targeted. Because yeah. this cult does not want them um, telling uh, the rest of the people what... Um, what it what what they have perceived and you know plato uh, did that uh, i think brilliant description of reality known as the allegory of the cave where he talked about uh, prisoners in a cave uh, at, who um, were in chains and the only thing they could see was the wall of the cave in front of them and there was a fire behind them um, and but they could see that, uh, and there were people and animals walking past the fire, but they could see them. But what they were doing was projecting their shadows on the wall that the prisoners could see, and that became the reality of the prisoners. To to the prisoners, that was reality: the shadows on the wall. And he kind of describes how some of these prisoners became experts on the shadows on the wall. And what he was describing was today's academics and scientists mm -hmm. who, who, uh, who, who um, think they are uh, exploring and understanding reality when what they're actually exploring and, and, um, and perceiving is a, is a simulation, not the greater reality. Uh, and uh, he describes how one of the prisoners got out, uh, realized the situation, came back, tried to tell the other prisoners, this is, uh, this is not real, it's not like this. And, of course, they didn't believe him, uh, which, is, uh, which is the story of, of history, really. Uh, but like I say, I think before this simulation situation occurred and human genetics was manipulated to basically tune us into that information source, um, humanity was 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 very different, um, very much more expanded, expansive, and um, aware of the greater reality. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I always find it interesting that they figured this out thousands of years ago with, and they didn't have the internet, they didn't have technology like we have now, or access to resources like we have now. They just had literally themselves. And it seems to be that's the only way that you can come to this conclusion. Like, there's no way that I could tell somebody that. And they're like, oh, of course, yes, I am infinite consciousness having this subjective experience. It doesn't really click when you tell somebody or you read something. It seems to be some kind of direct experience that we all have to come to. And it's more of just like a feeling, like something in your intuition that allows you to reach that revelation, at least for me. Um, so what was it for you? Like, was it your ayahuasca experience that allowed you to attain that or was it something else? Well, it was, um, it was a series of things, really. Um, I, I was a television presenter with the BBC, uh, used to introduce the sports programs and you know, news, uh, occasionally. And, um, I was also a national spokesman for the British Green Party. This is 1989. And, uh, during that year, I started to feel that 
if I was in a room alone, I wasn't alone. There was a presence there. And this was both intriguing me and bewildering me because it, it was very tangible to me and became more so as 89 became uh, 1990. It was very tangible. And I ended up in um, March 1990 in a hotel room in London. I was working for the BBC. It's called the Kensington Hilton. It's still there. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed after I've just got back over from the television centre, which is just not far away. And um, this presence in the room was so tangible. I said out into the room, you know, if there's something there, would you please contact me? Could you drive me up the wall? And then a, a few days later, I, um, I was with my son, uh, Gareth. He was a little boy then. And uh, I had this experience in, in a new shop. He was looking at some books, uh, steam train books over here. And uh, I, um, I said to him, come on, guys, we'll go and get some lunch. Uh, but the atmosphere around me changed. I now realize it was an electromagnetic field, but I didn't know that then. The atmosphere around me changed. And I, I heard not a voice, but a very strong thought form go through my, my mind, which said, go and look at the books on the far side. And um, in a bewildered state, I walked across because I knew this new shop and that the, the books over there were all romantic novels, you know, not my team. Really. But I went across because I was intrigued and bewildered again. And I looked at these uh, these books and they were all romantic novels, and except one, it was a, a book called Mind to Mind by a professional psychic called Betty Shine. And what hit me immediately as I turned the book over, I, her face was on the front, I turned it over and I saw the word psychic. I thought, I wonder if she would pick up what's been happening to me for the last year this presence, whatever it is. So um, I read the book in 24 hours, contacted her, and I went to see her. I didn't tell her anything. I didn't tell her anything was happening. Um, but she did kind of Reiki, hands-on healing, as it's called, Reiki. And um, I had arthritis, still have to an extent, but um, it's virtually disappeared now. But I had real bad arthritis then um, in uh, many of the joints. That's what fo finished my football career, my soccer career. And uh, so I, I just told her, look, I've got this, I've got this arthritis. Maybe your 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 healing might be able to help. But what I really went for was, when she pick up what's going on. So I went a couple of times, and she did the the, the healing, and I um, we had a nice chat. But I, I went the third time, and um, she's uh, got her hands near my left knee, and uh, suddenly I felt like a spider's web on my face. Uh, which hit me immediately because I'd read in her book that when other levels of reality are trying to lock into you, um, you sometimes feel like a spider's web on your face. Well, I did very clearly. And then I realized what it was again. It was an electromagnetic field. And I said nothing to uh, to, to Betty. Um, uh, but uh, just a few seconds later, while I'm still thinking, God, I read that in her book, uh, the um, she she launches her head back and says, my God, this is powerful. I've got to close my eyes for this one. And she tells me, this is uh, March 1990, towards the end of March 1990, that I, uh, she was being told I'm going to go out on a world stage and reveal great secrets, that uh, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world, that I would face enormous opposition, but, but quote, they would always, always be there to protect me. And that information, I was going to be led to information, and information at other times would be put directly into my mind, and I just know something. And uh, so, you, of course, you're sitting there and you think, well, look, you know, I, I'm just about to get on a train and go and present a sports program. <laughs> What's going on? But something in here, something in here, so go for it, go for it, go for it. And I did. And um, uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, for instance, the BBC didn't run a, renew my contract, which was like out of nowhere. Uh, and, and again, like, you know, going down the river, uh, seeing only the next bend in the river, you think, oh, God, I've got no income. What's going on? But what it did was free me to, to go on a journey um, without having to think, oh, I've got to go do a program. Uh, so uh, it was a gift, again, disguised as, um, you know, something you, in the face of it you wouldn't want to happen. So I, 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 my life became exactly what... Uh, I was told it, it became a synchronistic uh, journey of uh, walking into information, personal experiences, people, 
documents, books. And it was like someone's handing you puzzle pieces uh, in a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, and and you, you were putting them together. And other times, and this basically is what happened after about, well, very pretty, pretty much soon after this process started, maybe a year, two years, um, instead of um, look, coming across information and then concluding what it meant, I would know something, and then the information to support that would come to me. Uh, and that's been pretty much the way around it's gone um, um, ever since. And I, um, I ended up in, um, when would it be, February um, 1991, going to Peru for no other reason than this said go to Peru, because that's what was happening by then. So I go to Peru and I had uh, some amazing experiences uh, in places like Machu Picchu and um, uh, a place called Siustani near to um, uh, the Lake Titicaca. And I, I came back um, like it was like you're living in a bubble and someone comes along and bursts the bubble and suddenly all that was outside the bubble is coming in. And uh, for about three months, I didn't know where I was or, or what was going on. It was like pressing too many keys on a computer and the computer froze. And um, I went on to a absolutely prime time television chat show in the middle of all that. And from then uh, was generated the enormity of the ridicule that followed for years and years and years. Um, but it was all, it was all connected. So um, I have this phrase, you know, life gives you your greatest gifts brilliantly disguised as your worst nightmare. Uh, so that ridicule set me free. And um, after about three months, the, the computer unfroze and I was looking at the same world, but I wasn't seeing the same world. I was seeing a very different world. I was seeing things that I, I, I didn't see before. Uh, thing, I was seeing how things connected that I you know, wasn't seeing before. And uh, this has just gone on um, to present day where um, the information just comes to you and you, you put it together and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. It started off in the early 1990s. The information was basically how the world was controlled by a few people and to what end. And then from about, you know, about 96 maybe, um, the whole non-human side of this came in. From just after the turn of the millennium, the nature of reality came in. That's when I had my ayahuasca experience, 2003 in Brazil. Um, uh, which was um, uh, just life-changing, or certainly perception change. Because for five hours, I, I took it twice. I could have taken it four times, but two was enough for me. Um, and uh, in, this, in this rainforest. And on the second night, I took it. And well, I, I go into an altered state after about an hour. And for anyone who's not taken ayahuasca, it's a very strange thing because when you close your eyes, you're in a different reality. And when you open your eyes, you're, you're back in the reality you were, you, you, you know. But what happens is your eyes don't want to stay open. They want to shut. Mm. And uh, for five hours, this female voice, as powerful and loud as mine is now, um, talked to me about the nature of reality and explained it's all an illusion. Why? Uh, and uh, when I came back to England, I had total recall of what was told, told to me. I came back to England and I started looking at it you know, different scientific disciplines. And I realized that, you know, if, if you look at them uh, individually and then you take what bits of them, the bits of what all of them have kind of known uh, and, and, and concluded, and then you put them together, that um, actually the information is already there that what that voice told me is true. It's world's an illusion. It's not, it's not physical at all. And, uh, and so this is the, the, the process that's, that's, um, that I, I, I've been uh, going through, and you reach a point where the fact that you are consciousness uh, and the fact that this world's an illusion in terms of its physicality and how we perceive it and experience it, you go from it being a concept to it being a, a you, so it's not outside of you anymore as a concept. You you basically become it. Mm. 
and it's a, it's an incredible um, it's an incredible feeling because when when that process happens, the world doesn't affect you in the same way. Yeah. Uh, so you're much more um, you're much more. It's just an experience than letting the experience um, impact upon you. It doesn't mean there aren't things you'd like to happen and things you don't like to happen, but the the enormity of the impact is not the same. So you find an equilibrium. I can only say what I've done. You find an equilibrium where you're not darting around emotionally, up and down. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, it's great. Life's so great. Ooh. Yeah. It's much more, you're much more phlegmatic. And, you know, <laughs> when you look at current events, um, that don't half come in handy. Because if, if, you are, if you are only seeing through the five senses and you're only seeing through three score years and ten of a human life and you look at your kids and you look at your grandkids and you think, what the hell is it going to be like for them? You only perceive it at that level, then it, it it's it's a nightmare. What's happening? An absolute absolute nightmare. Yeah. But um, when you when you take a step back and you say, look, it's just an experience. There'll be another one along in a minute. And oh, by the way, my kids and my grandkids—they're also a point of attention with an infinite awareness. They may have a child's body, and that child's body may be uh, more limited at that point in the way it decodes reality and what it understands. But uh, as, as, the, as the body uh, uh, develops and matures, it's able to process more information and you become what we call an adult. Um, and at puberty, there's a big uh, uh, kind of advancement of that. Uh, but we interact as parents and children and grandparents and, and, and grandchildren and that's that that's good I, I do all the time I love it but if you go back one step we're, we're all no matter what we call ourselves or perceive ourselves in a certain moment we're all points of attention within an infinite state of awareness on an infinite journey of exploring forever and uh, it, it 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 takes the not, yeah, yeah it, it does. Yeah, yeah, it does take takes the, a lot of the drama out of it. Yeah, and and so you you're able to look at things more dispassionately in the sense that you you don't get caught in the drama, and 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 the drama um, therefore doesn't uh, skew your the, the way that you can observe and see and decide what you need to do in certain situations because once you yeah. get in the drama you stop yeah. thinking straight yeah exactly and, but, but this well, actually, i guess the word that keeps coming to me is you you find a calmness it doesn't mean you're always calm it means you're calm most of the time compared with what you were before <laughs> yeah it's knowing that it's always there that kind of peace that, that yeah. other side in a way it's it's always there to access yeah. It's a sort of salvation in a way. Yes, it is. It's, it certainly is now. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't um, you don't engage with the world. My God, that's, I do it all the time. Trying to make a difference. You're trying to uh, break this stranglehold on information, therefore perception, which this cult is seeking to have. So you do all that because you want it to be a nicer, more pleasant, freer world than it is. But you do it without getting caught in the drama because you know there used to be a um well i guess there still is the repeats it was a um a comedy program on british television it may have been shown in america a bit called dad's army and it was called dad's army because um, during the second world war the early years um uh, britain was in a mess it, it had no organization or anything so um, they um, engaged uh, people who were either too young to join the army in the war or too old, 
and they got them to kind of protect the locations around Britain, especially on the the, um, the east coast, looking out towards Europe and Germany, and they become known as Dad's Army. And uh, so there's this comedy about this, and I'm, you know that's just a bit of background. The reason I'm telling this story is there was a character in it called Corporal Jones, and Corporal Jones would, um, when anything happened that was um, was was not good, he would jump and run around shouting, "Don't panic! Don't panic! Don't panic! Don't panic!" while doing exactly that. And, of course, while he's saying don't panic, while he's um, caught in the drama, he's not thinking straight. Uh, and in no way can he impact upon um, changing the situation because he can't think how to change the situation. And that's what kind of happens when you get caught in the drama. Uh, and, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm not coming uh, from a point of view of, oh, no, I'm above all this. I, I spent many, many years of my life getting caught in the drama. Uh, and it was a great experience because I, I realized I, 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 having done that, I now can feel and experience the difference when you don't do that. But um, that's what uh, re-self-identity does. Yeah. You go from perceiving yourself as, um, as a little insignificant me uh, trying to get from cradle to grave to um, an infinite me Having a brief experience, yep. going from cradle to grave, um, <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a totally different experience, totally different way of doing things. Yeah, exactly, David. It's not that we have to stop playing the game; we still have to play the game in this body in this meat suit. It's just that it enables me, at least, to play the game a little bit better. To having yeah, that it, point of view, it it. it, it, it you still play the game. In other words, you still experience a human life. Well, what's the point of, of, of coming here if you're not going to experience it? The difference is you know it's a game. Mm -hmm. You know the context in which it's happening. And if you don't know the context within it's happening, then, then obviously you're not going to see it for what it is. Do you think the context is love? Like when you say infinite love is the only truth? Yes, I'm... That's the foundation, uh, in my view, of um, of, of reality, of, of, of consciousness. But it's also all that is, has been, and ever can be. It's also all possibility. So while um, what we call love, beyond anything that we perceive love as uh, most of the time, it's certainly not you know just the law of attraction, which is what how love is perceived. Um, the foundation of it all is is what we call love. Uh, we have to call it unconditional love to to really um, give what we're really talking about, as opposed to attraction love alone. But um, obviously, from that foundation, then all possibility is possible. So, within all possibility is the possibility that um, some force will become uh, so uh, distorted in its, in its way of seeing things that it, it, it feels the need to have power over others. Uh, and, you know, what is life? What is a human life? And what is, what is actually infinite life? It's a simple sequence of of choice and consequence, choice and consequence, choice and consequence. So you make choices and those choices produce consequences. And then based on whether you like the consequences or whether you don't, you then make different choices and you have different consequences. And the same sequence goes on. It's choice and consequence, choice and consequence. Choice it's and karma. Consequence. Yeah. Well, that, that's another way of looking at cause effect. Yeah. But so if you look at what's happened, see, what I do is I expose who's actually doing it, what's actually doing it, and to what end. But what I don't do is look at an us and them situation. Mm. Because billions can only be controlled and manipulated if, if the billions give their power away to those manipulating. So, I, I, it can't happen any other way. Uh, so humanity may not like what's happening, but it's played a fundamental part in making it happen. 
because the choices we've made as a human race to give our power away to the few and to give our perceptions away to the few who tell us what to think, that's a choice and it has a consequence. And the consequence now is that uh, a, a relative handful of people are dictating in, in ever fiercer more, uh, detail the nature of human life. But it's not irreversible because uh, when you're dealing with billions being manipulated and a, 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 a comparative uh, a fraction of that, a very small fraction of that doing the manipulating, obviously it's reversible. But it's reversible only when the sequence of choice and consequence is broken by people making different choices, mm -hmm. and then they'll create a different consequence. So instead of acquiescing with their own enslavement and playing a part in their own enslavement of the enslavement of the kids and the grandkids, you say, no, I'm not doing it. You know, people think no is a, is, a, is a negative. Oh, no, is a no, it's negative. No, no. No can be the most positive um, word, the most positive state you can have. Because if, if, if some force tells you to do something uh, with the um, intention of enslaving you, the greatest thing you can say is no. No, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not wearing a mask. I'm not doing all this nonsense that your psychologists are telling me to do because you want to take uh, uh, my, my mind apart and make me submissive. I'm not doing it. And that's a different choice. And it will have a different consequence. If enough people do it, it will have a massively different consequence because this nonsense will come to an end. Because what we're looking at is a situation where humanity in vast numbers are enslaved by a few people because those vast numbers have given their power away to a few people. That is the choice, and that is the consequence. And so we need to make different choices, and we'll have different consequences. But until we do, this will go on. Mm -hmm. because we, we keep making the same choice, we're going to still get the same consequence. <laughs> um, but it's in our power not to do so, to change it. Mm -hmm. I think the world is changing, though. We're at a point in time where this is unlike any point in time, where even though it seems as though the world's going to shitty chaos um there is the other aspect the yin and the yang well on the other aspect the other side of the coin there's people like me and you and just being able to have this conversation just knowing that there is that other side there's a lot of people coming to that conclusion at this point in time currently um it's a slow process but i think just as a handful of people can manipulate the world into fear i think a handful of people can also manipulate if you want to use the word manipulate the world into love. Um, yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I see I see it from a slightly different perspective. When you say, um, you know, it's slow, yeah, yeah it, it's a hell of a lot slower than I'd like it. But when I, when I go back to 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, um, then, uh, and I see how many people were interested in this stuff. And then I see how many people are interested now, especially since the events of 2020 uh, to present time, then um, I, I see it as changing actually quite rapidly. Mm. And what, what I'm looking at now is uh, people that have bought the, the thought into the fear uh, and look to authority to protect them from what the authority is manipulated with the fear. Um, they seem to be going deeper and deeper into the coma. But there's, there's been a, a tremendous awakening among enormous numbers of people, actually, since the start of 2020, because of the events that have taken place, in which they're reassessing everything. They're reassessing uh, who is really running the world and to what end. And they're also reassessing, you know, the, the whole greater who am I, what's it all about? And the reason that it doesn't seem to be um, as big as it actually is, is because you'll never hear about it in the media. I mean, if you get your information from the mainstream media, you're never going to hear that there's an awakening taking place, A, because they, you know, they, they won't know uh, because of the circles they operate in, and, but also they, they, you know, that which controls the media, it doesn't want to start um, 
publicizing the fact there's awakening going on. He wants yeah. people to sleep. He wants to mm-hmm. the other way. But, but but there is, and you know, I, I'm a kind of a barometer of it because, you know, I, I walk down the streets, uh, like I said earlier, um, in the um, in in the 1990s, and and I just got ridiculed and laughed at. Uh, and and when I walk down the streets now, I'm stopped all the time by um, by people who, who may be new to this or not long into this, who just want to talk to you about. Um, things in a serious, serious way, um, and and you know I've seen people that have suddenly um, gone down this road. Who, if you'd have told me when I knew them ten years ago that one day they go down this road, you think, well, you know, well that's that would be a bloody miracle. But they are because people can change very fast once the programming starts to break down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 you know when when you. When I remember what it was like, and I, I, I have the experience now, a lot of people have woken up. It's just that we're not hearing about it um, yeah. uh, through the sources of information. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when I started out um, in the early 1990s, the, the uh, places that, you, that, that were interested in you speaking or anything were so few. It was just the odd radio station. There was the Jeff Wren show. I remember I've known Jeff since way back um, in those days, and and so you you go on that, and there'd be one or two. And if you if you because the you know the internet wasn't around, if you were um, basically um, wanting to put a meeting on, then you literally were still printing leaflets and handing them out in the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and there wasn't the interest. But now, I, I do um, I do interviews virtually every day, uh, virtually every day. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm I'm on a roll at the moment. It's going to be about ten or twelve days in a row because uh, I'm doing them wow. over the weekend as well. Um, now, what a difference that is! Yeah. That again, that alone shows you the the interest there is in these in these subjects. That there are so many people that are, are not only want to talk to you, but have have channels and and shows that talk about this stuff. I mean, I can't tell you just what a massive expansion there has been. There is there, there is an awakening going. There is. It's just that it's not being uh, broadcast on TV mm-hmm. and in the newspapers, but uh, it is happening. And there comes a point where there, there is going to come a point. When that breaks out into the public arena in a way that um, even the mainstream won't be able to ignore. I mean, they'll demonize it and they'll spin it, but they won't be able to ignore it. Mm. And that is coming. Yeah. I think it's because uh, your different perspective is because you're also, you've been doing this since before I was born. So I, I have the perspective of seeing it slow because I've only been yeah. here 27 years. So, but you've seen the whole change. I completely understand. Um, if, if, if I hadn't have, um, started out 31 years ago, I would see it as very slow. Yeah. But because I did, it, it is, it's getting faster. It's getting faster and it's getting faster. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when it was virtually zilch, nil. So um, it, it's, um, it's very different today. But because, you know, there comes a point where what has been manipulated covertly has to break the surface because it's okay you can only covertly manipulate for a certain amount of time but if you want to transform global society then at some point you've got to break the surface and start doing that in a way that people can see it and that's what's happened since the turn of 2020 you know the uh, the cults has entered the room if you like hmm. and so um and with all the events that have gone on uh, it's concentrated the minds of a lot of people to, to see that um, actually the world's not like they thought it was. And that, that although the fear has closed a lot more of people down more, it's the events that are undeniable, unless you, are, you absolutely want to go into denial, has awakened a lot of people. So there's some, there's some good things about it as well as, um, as well as some things we'd rather not have. Yes, it's the yin and yang, it's the balance. That's the one, I guess. 
Oh, man. But there's okay. There's hope, you know, there's hope and salvation within all of us. No matter if we are moving toward an Orwellian dystopian future on the outside, on the inside, there's always that peace and that stillness that we talked about before. Yeah, but you you can you can you can transfer that into, yeah, into, into the, the outside. world of the of, into the world of the scene and the experienced, um, yeah. and that's what we're trying to do. And mm -hmm. Like I say, um, when perception changes on uh, any scale, then the world changes, and um, you know perception is changing, and uh, it's not over yet. <laughs> it's not over yet. We're getting there, y'all. But uh, yeah, I think we can wrap this thing up, David, on that note. Uh, do you have any closing statements you'd like to give the world? No, it's uh, just realize that you're not what they tell you you are. You're not, you know, Ethel on the checkout and Bill driving a bus. Uh, oh, I'm only driving a bus, you know, I, uh, little me. No, no. Uh, you are consciousness that is having a, a brief experience as Bill driving the bus. Um, it's just an experience. Uh, you are potentially um, whatever you um, you choose to be in terms of how, how much consciousness you want to expand into. And the more you do, the more your life will change. And it's it's a, it's a redefinition of self identity. You know, I've I've, I've been through. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen so much, and I you know I've I've seen the the quests and the fasts and the and all this this stuff. And I'm not knocking it, but you know, in my experience, it's much simpler than that. You change your self-identity. Because as you change your self-identity and your self-identity, you, you perceive as much more expanded and ever more expanded, then your consciousness expands as your perception of yourself expands. Um, and uh, you become a different, um, a different person and you see the world in a different way. Your potential to create things expands the more you expand your consciousness the more consciousness you're accessing to manifest into a into a reality into an experience so the your potential of experience expands as well so when you start to awaken your life becomes much more what people call synchronistic you know as people awaken they one of the things they notice is um is synchronicity oh what a coincidence oh my god fancy that happening and all, all that's happening is that they, as they expand their consciousness and access more and more of the true self, they are um, uh, accessing more and more of all possibility. And so more possibility comes into their lives. We perceive it as synchronicity and coincidences. And, oh, my God, what's the chances of that happening? But all you're doing is, is accessing more and more of all possibility and so manifesting more of all possibility than you were before. And, um, you know, if you perceive yourself as little me, I've got no power, then you're not going to access that much of all possibility because you're limiting it by your sense of possibility. When that changes, especially your sense of your own possibility, then suddenly what you manifest changes. Your life starts to become an adventure instead of something to endure and to get through. Well said. Well said. It becomes an adventure and a journey and much more enjoyable. That's for sure. The worst thing that can happen is we, we experience forever, forever. That's as bad as it gets. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, there are things we like and there's things we not like. But whatever, we're still exploring forever, forever. Whatever <laughs> hell happens here. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you very much, David. Thanks, mate. appreciate you. Um, your work will not be in vain. Uh, you, you're doing the right thing in this life. Uh, keep doing your thing, man. And uh, yeah, let's keep uh, fighting the good fight, huh? Oh yeah, I will. <laughs> and um, uh, it's um, it's a great time to be alive. It's uh, it is a great adventure, despite the challenges. Yeah. yeah, been a pleasure. Thanks very much, mate. Thank you very much, David. Have a good night. Bye.